Yes, I uh, started the mandate on the 1st of August, so I'm six months in on this mandate on freedom of religion or belief. The role of a rapporteur, and we have around just over 50 special rapporteurs of the United Nations, is to report uh, regularly to the United Nations on either the thematic issue or the country matter that they are entrusted with. So, you know, the United Nations Human Rights Council meets several times a year. The General Assembly meets once a year. So what, uh, you know, who is there to investigate, to explore the, the thematic issue at the country level in between sessions? Um, that is the task of an independent, unpaid <laughs> expert that will report regularly to the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council. It is framed by the freedom of thought, conscience, religion or belief in international human rights law. Some of that is established in binding law or hard law and some of it is um, you know, the normative guidelines and mandate practice of freedom of religion or belief that has developed um, in the mandate practice over 37 years and um, other standards that we have in soft law. That is the framework in which the mandate operates. Of course, my meeting with NGOs is year-round. I meet online, in person, around the world with them. But yes, the meeting uh, of the Human Rights Council has side events and that's yet another opportunity to meet uh, civil society, non-government organizations, especially those that focus either exclusively or partially on freedom of religion or belief. And you know, we use the term religion or belief as a abbreviation of freedom of thought, conscience, religion or belief. So, you know, it is always, we know that its protection in international law is broader than freedom of religion. Uh, the opportunity at the Human Rights Council is to present, but also, as you say, a lot of side meetings, a lot of meetings, a lot of interactions that really enrich the mandate because a lot of the information actually that the, the mandate is able to report and to explore and to examine and to put forward is gleaned uh, from non-government organizations. So imagine that the mandate goes to a country. These are usually 10-day visits where one examines, in my case, of course, freedom of religion or belief. If I didn't have the opportunity to meet with non-government organizations and religious and belief communities, um, that wouldn't balance out and broaden the information that the government itself is reporting to me. So it's absolutely essential. The report itself, I've already submitted my report, but the report itself is made public because you know it takes time to uh, also translate it into the other UN languages. It is made public one week before it is presented at the UN Human Rights Council. Um, and actually, I could talk about it <laughs> in, in broad terms. I can't release the report for you, but I can speak about it. I try to capture where we are at in this landscape of freedom of religion or belief internationally because I have found, you know, we know that it has changed quite dramatically in recent years. There are many more actors that use the framework of freedom of religion or belief in their work in a variety of ways, whether they are primarily interested in religion or belief and development or humanitarian work, religion or belief um, at the local level, the national level, the international level, there are many, and in fact, even the diplomatic community has many, many more groupings that are concerned about freedom of religion and belief. We have ambassadors, we have envoys, we have groupings uh, of states and of civil society, we have regional civil society groups. So I try to um, paint a picture, an imperfect, incomplete picture, but a picture of this broad landscape of actors. And I ask the question, why is it that although we have more actors, we seem to have not resolved or reduce the challenge of freedom of religion or belief. So this is not a critique, but it's a really a question also for myself, an ongoing question. The mandates use the same three primary um, channels. One is communications, one is country visits, and the third one is reporting. Of course, alongside of that, there are 
many, many opportunities of interactions, inputs, giving advice, consulting, encouraging, etc. But communications are where individuals or groups who feel they are suffering violations of freedom of religion or belief can get in touch with the mandate. The mandate does a quick check that they, they have the approval of the victims, lays it out uh, more thoroughly in a legal sense, and then intervenes with the government concerned and says, we, have, we are concerned about reports about this situation in your country. Please, could you elaborate? Could you look into it? Could you address this issue? So this is a direct intervention on behalf of potential victims with the government concerned. Also, we issue press releases and there are other communications and many of them are joint with other special rapporteurs. Country visits, uh, we have the resources uh, and ability uh, as the mandate holder to go to two countries per year. These are roughly 10 day, two week visits and to examine uh, that situation um, and to report on it. And then the opportunity for two thematic reports, one to the UN Human Rights Council and one to the UN General Assembly. So this is sort of paints the picture of the reporting channels, the investigation channels, the receiving information and intervening channels. This is it in a snapshot. Well, actually, I mean, the work is done at the grassroots and around the world and, and networks and groups uh, and NGOs are critical to that. So, it, you know, you don't, you, you can be playing a very important role in freedom of religion or belief and its promotion and protection and advancement and have no interaction with the mandate. So let me, <laughs> let me state that. But for, for the mandate itself, then uh, those communications, if you see that there are violations to encourage those victims or to guide them and advise them to submit um, their communications, if they feel it will be helpful to them, then here is a UN channel and voice that will intervene on their behalf. Secondly, when I go to countries, obviously I really welcome uh, information and your experiences um, with uh, co-religionists or collaborators in, in that country. As I said, again, to enrich the picture that, uh, and the reports that I'm receiving. And thirdly, I, I welcome suggestions about themes that might, um, you know, it might be timely or appropriate to address them. Well, even if we just look at uh, this conference, and I, I believe those that are watching this video will also have access to the files of, of this conference, the reports were much broader than that. They weren't only academic uh, and sort of so-called uh, professional presentations. They were also experiences. And even when it is academics and professionals, what they are often most keen to do is projects on the ground. So we heard some wonderful examples of civil society initiatives or joint initiatives that are engaging with the grassroots and trying to advance freedom of religion and belief at that level. It's the, it's the human experience of these violations and seeking to address them that is and should be at the heart of the matter. You know, and I think this defense, I think we should remind ourselves that this defense is not isolated from other human rights work or humanitarian work or grassroots service and activities. So it is part and, uh, you know, uh, at least I don't see it as completely separate or disengaged. So when somebody is suffering freedom of religion or belief, they rarely, they may be targeted because of their religion or belief, but their targeting will then unfortunately often also mean that they don't have equality before the law, that they don't have due process of the law, that they are also uh, targeted, you know, also advantage is taken of, of, of the fact that they're a child or they're a woman. So many other rights become entangled and endangered when uh, there is a targeting on grounds of religion or belief. So we shouldn't isolate it. Um, secondly, how can they, there are many projects, there are trainings we heard just in the uh, this session about peer-to-peer -peer learning and uh, collaborations between faith and belief communities. There are many opportunities and, and many of them we can learn about um, online. It's critical and actually my next report to the UN General Assembly will be trying to look at that grassroots lens of the experience of freedom of religion or belief where 
lawyers may often speak about the state as a, a violator or respecter of um, freedom of religion or belief, but who are the, at the local level, who are the, those who promote um, and ensure freedom of religion or belief and who are those that endanger religion or belief? They are the local planners, they are the municipality, they are the council workers, they are the neighbors, they are the civil society networks, they are the parliamentarians. There are so many actors and I want to open that debate to, to recognizing those as critical actors. And, and youth, yes, they, they play a crucial role. If we are curious about this, I think we need to search quite widely. So there are the youth camps and projects, there are the encounters, they are the joint activities between faith and belief communities, but they are also the literacy programs, the trainings that are about intercultural dialogue, uh, freedom of religion or belief, diversity, etc. So there's a wide range of uh, possibilities and we should also encourage new ones that are appropriate to you know what the youth enjoy where are the spaces they gather what are the activities and around that also naturally and then purposefully of course can grow understanding and uh, respect for the other we found it difficult to break this down it's such a vast topic but uh, so everybody approached it try to capture part of this but you know to to ensure that we don't see these as at all contradictory yes they can sometimes um, become be seen in a simple way as being conflicting but actually expression is crucial to freedom of religion or belief manifestation of religion or belief is a form of expression and expression can also be the tool of coexistence and harmony understanding fraternity it's been given many many names but in legal terms i would call it respect of the human rights of others you know there there are many but let me focus on two of them um, that uh, a couple of the speakers addressed in this conference. One of them is blasphemy and the other one is apostasy. Now, apost uh, because this also arises in the communications that come to the mandate, so I want to give some attention to it. Apostasy is when somebody is punished or is accused of a crime uh, merely because it comes to the attention of the authorities that they have changed their religion or belief. Apostasy is particularly problematic in relation to the human rights of freedom of religion or belief because uh, freedom of religion or belief protects our right to be able to have, adopt or change our religion or belief without any coercion. So any accusation of somebody or criminalization of somebody on the alleged crime of uh, apostasy is not acceptable to international human rights law or to the mandate. So I always... Uh, um, raise these issues with the government concerned. The other one is blasphemy and the blasphemy laws that we have will always be rooted in uh, alleged blasphemy in relation to a particular religious sensibility. Um, there's no way of, um, we should look at the UN Human Rights Committee General Comment 34 which expresses deep concern about blasphemy charges and laws because this disadvantages minorities and the very fact of belonging to another religion or belief can itself be considered blasphemy by others. So these are both very problematic issues in relation to freedom of religion or belief. I think it's very interesting when conferences take up the challenge of a broad field and a broad area. Um, and, but I, on the other hand, I think it elicits a variety of responses and focused responses. So I think it would be fair to say that none of us managed to <laughs> exhaust the full theme, but each of us gave uh, a partial perspective and response to it. And, and that creates um, the opportunity to hear many diverse responses and, and views on it. And to that extent, it was really enriching and, and, and broad uh, and beneficial.